Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante of Wikibon. I'm here with Paul Gillen. This is the MIT Information Quality Symposium. We've been here for two days covering this wall-to-wall. -wall. This is theCUBE. Justin Magruder is here. He's the founder and principal owner of Noetic Partners, a financial services consultancy, uh, former chief data officer at Freddie Mac, uh, right during the financial crisis. So a very interesting segment here. Justin, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. So nice start by you. telling us a little bit about Noetic Partners and then we sure. want to ask you about data quality and financial services. Sure, sure. We formed Noetic uh, about four and a half years ago uh, as I was leaving Freddie Mac and as, as some of my partners were also deciding to move forward in, the, in sort of the ashes of the credit crisis, if you will. Um, Noetic is a, uh, is a consultancy, but what we've done is, is we've really um, come up with an approach to managing financial information based upon the concept that every party involved in the financing world um, is important and the roles those parties play uh, in transactions and the roles those parties, um, the relationships those parties have with other parties is fundamental to understanding financial services and the financial markets. And it's, it's a concept that's not new, but it's a concept that I think we've taken to the next level. Um, and we've done this work at some of the larger uh, global investment banks and commercial banks uh, and some smaller firms as well. And we think it's an approach that has helped our clients and our, our, our counterparts, our customers, um, uh, understand their risks better and frankly make more money and, and, and lose less money. Well, so was so straight out was what happened with the mortgage-backed security crisis and the CDOs, et cetera, was it fundamentally a data quality problem? I think data quality and, and, and our lack of data was absolutely a fundamental component of the credit crisis. I think the banks that were involved in underwriting loans and requiring loans and pooling them and selling them to investors did not have information about the underlying um, monthly debt obligations and income uh, and assets held by borrowers. I think it's well known. Uh, we had things we called MinJoin back then, which meant uh, no income, no job, no assets. And we had lenders, uh, some of them no longer exist, who were making MinJoins um, because of the froth in the market. Because we saw, if you recall in 06, 07, prices were going up, people were buying and selling homes and flipping them, and the transparency that the actual underwriters had to the content, the reference data, about the people they were lending to, not the collateral. I think people understand the collateral well, but the reference data about borrowers and guarantors and obligators was not, not good. And I think that was a problem. Um, I think it, it, in my role, it, it uh, prevented us from truly understanding the nature of the risk of the pools that we were assisting uh, in my time at, uh, at Freddie Mac. Well, so a lot of people pointed the fingers at the credit you know, eight rating agencies, um, which, Really, I mean, yeah. given the scope of the problem, right, they weren't going to own that. So, so um, you know, we've all seen that, you know, effect, you know, the, the, the effect on the economy, the effect on, you know, Dodd-Frank now comes along. Um, so, so take us back to, you know, that situation to the extent that you can and share with us, you know, you, you were there, you saw, you know, firsthand what was happening. Um, what was it like th at that point, uh, particularly from a data quality standpoint, sure. and, and what, have, what have we learned from that? Sure. I think most people look at the crisis and they see the security, uh, the pools of thousands or, or uh, hundreds or thousands of mortgages, and they see weighted average coupon rates, and they see information about mortgages that was pooled together and aggregated, and they see a price for a security, and they see a rating. What they don't see is the underlying mortgages. and in a pool um, issued by a Bear Stearns or a Lehman Brothers or a Fannie Mae or a Ginnie Mae or a Freddie Mac, there might be thousands of mortgages with hundreds of data elements. And, and those details necessarily were obscured from the investors because I don't want someone uh, knowing about my home just because my, my loan is part of a pool. And I think that's fair, the privacy issues are, are real. But the lack of disclosure and the lack of transparency to investors prevented them and the ratings agencies from really understanding the risk around particular borrowers and particular markets where pricing prices had uh, appreciated significantly. Okay, so I mean a granular view was maybe not appropriate, but at yeah. least a uh, some data and information on the quality of that granular view <laughs> would Absolutely. have been more appropriate. Absolutely. You, you know, I, I've lived through a number of financial meltdowns <laughs> now. Uh, the 
the savings and loan crisis, the uh, dot com meltdown, and and uh, uh, the uh, and the, the one the last one the last one in the late eighties, um, the Wall Street Wall Street crash. It seems like uh, some people say credit credit unions are going to be the next great vulnerability. It seems like the the uh, there's a consistent thread here, which is that they were uh, all caused by people lending too much money beyond their means. Right? People, it, it was it was too it was too easily available credit being given to the wrong people. Is that a problem that can be addressed by data, by by better quality data, or is this fundamentally just greed? <laughs> I, I think it's uh, uh, without the data we can't understand the risk that is inherent in lending money to counterparties. Um, I think greed is always at the center of it. I think uh, Michael Douglas was right. Greed is good. Uh, it keeps our markets moving. Uh, but I think risk controls and understanding and transparency are fundamental. And, and, and I think it's the reference data, uh, the mundane, simple, uh, basic reference data about who am I dealing with? What products are they using? What is the risk? What are the cash flows? What's the collateral? If people don't understand that when they're making deals and lending money, then of course you're going to have another credit crisis. But isn't this more of a regulatory or, or a, 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 an issue, a, a tax issue? I mean, with the, the, the when these companies blow up spectacularly, it's almost always because the, the, the corporate organization is so complex. You know, Enron with all of these offshore subsidiaries, and you could they, nobody could figure out what Enron was or how it was organized. Enron's a great example. So. Um, is, I mean, can you fix that with data? Is that a, is that a, a transparency Absolutely. problem? Absolutely. I think data is the root of the solution. Um, Enron's a great example. Enron was a, a collection of hundreds of, of legal entities with, with complex relationships with other legal entities. Uh, during and, and before the Enron disaster, I worked for a large bank, uh, an investment bank that was exposed to Enron. And we built a counterparty structure like the one I'm talking about, and it's very um, the fundamentals of that model of understanding the relationships between the legal entities in Enron who'd issued debt and were issuing equity securities and making loans or, or taking loans and, and buying or selling commercial paper um, was what allowed the firm I worked for to get out of Enron before the crash. So understanding the parties involved and the relationships between parties is the most fundamental piece, I think, of, uh, which is reference data. Of, of banking and investment banking and understanding that risk and how you're exposed to all the parties involved will make and break the, the next financial crisis. And I think in we look at, uh, I was at the Mortgage Bankers Technology Convention in 07, uh, just as the crisis was about to unfold. And I remember sitting with some of the older fellows in the groups and they were telling me how, well, the last crisis, the crisis in 1990 or so, 91, 92, that was the big one, and this one was not going to approach that crisis. Well, I think the, the 08 crisis eclipsed that uh, early 90s crisis uh, by an order of magnitude, and I think, um, and the next one will will also, unless we begin to understand the parties we're working with. You know, banks are, requ are reporting earnings d just this week. A number of uh, banks reported, including Bank of America reported yesterday, I believe J.P. Morgan reported yesterday. Right. Record profits, I mean, they're, they're going great guns, business is great. Are we just setting ourselves up for another disaster here? Well, I, I think there's always risk. I think they're talking about increasing capital requirements for banks. I think that may make sense. But I'm not a banker. I'm a technology guy. I'm a data guy. Understood. Um, my view is the banks need to understand who they're doing business with. They need to understand the nature of their contracts with other uh, parties. And if they understand their exposure and their agreements and their commitments and their obligations to other parties, uh, then they can make better decisions than they've made in the past. I think structured products are interesting. We talked about CDOs and CMOs and all the, the crazy financial instruments that people thought up in the last decade or 15 years. And they're interesting, but I think if we had better understandings, if AIG had a better understanding of all the counterparty exposure it had, it, and Hank Greenberg actually had control of that before he left, I think if, if those details were available to decision makers, they may not make the bad decisions they've made in the past. But it's a good question that you're asking, right? Because, I mean, you, you, it was useful to go through so that the crashes uh, lived through them as well. When the dot-com bubble crashed, there wasn't a big injection of capital to you know, save the tech industry. No. That didn't happen. No. Uh, and then, of course, you, you had other factors. I mean, 9-11 was the, 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 the stomach punch there. Um, but 
one wonders, okay, so w because it feels like the recovery, I mean, not feels like, the recovery from the worst, you know, downturn in, in our life lifetimes uh, is actually seemingly smoother than it was coming out of the dot-com boom, significantly. You had 9-11, you had, you had Enron, and, and the money got sucked in by accountants, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and so now you're seeing this huge injection of capital, and to your, your point, this is just all artificial. Yeah, well you're not a banker, it, it you're seems an observer. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Not to step on you, Dave, but it, it seems right. like people always find ways around to, to beat the system. Yeah. Right. So no matter how much disclosure you demand, someone is always going to figure out a way to to yeah. manipulate it. So can is data really the problem? Well, and or it seems is behavior the and problem. It seems constantly to be escalating as well. I mean, you go back to yeah. Michael Lewis's books in the '80s, right? I mean, yeah. it's, you know, it just yeah. keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So can to Paul's point, I, I data think solve this? To your point, it is the people. Who are the parties? Parties are institutions. They're individuals. Who are they? Who are we dealing with? What's their history? Have we seen them over time? with certain behaviors? Are they in a new market they've never traded in before or invested in before? What's their credit rating now? What's it been in the past? Not just right now, but five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. What's the history and what's the nature? What's the indicative information about this counterparty that I should know before I enter into a deal with them? And, and understanding that is, you know, people take it on face value that the big banks, that Goldman and Citi and JP Morgan are good for it. And uh, six or eight years ago, we took it on face value that Bear Stearns and right. Lehman were also. Barclays, you know, or Bearings was, was, you know, 15 years ago, was also one of the oldest names in the business. Right. The bottom line is these things can change based upon the people inside making decisions without information that they need to have in order to understand their exposure and their risk. And I think that it comes back to data. Well, and, and I mean, there's hope here, right? I mean, I think of, um, I think of just even stock information, how difficult it was to get a real-time quote in the 80s. You had to have a big terminal, you had to be connected, it was very expensive, and, yeah. and that was yeah. sort of democratized. Uh, um, and, and, and so, a little transparency, you know, potentially. Yeah. Even the guys in, in the, the book, The Big Short, were yeah. concerned, and they had the data. Yeah. They were math guys, they had it all figured out. Even they, for a while, were worried that they weren't going to be able to cash out. So, yeah. so, yeah. so will that access to information, sort of create a transparency, uh, and sure. will, be, will, will average people be able to analyze that, sure. that, that data and visualize it? I don't know, what do you think? I, I, you know, it's interesting. I, when I joined uh, J.P. Morgan in the mid-90s, I wrote an acceptance letter, and I said I want to help. I was joining the reference data group to lead the counterparty account information group, and the, I wrote a, an acceptance letter saying I want to improve transparency and uh, market efficiency, and, and um, and, and I still believe that. I think that information is what it's all about. I, I was reading some articles the other day about um, some regulators quibbling with uh, uh, Thomson Reuters and some, some analysts about uh, investors who have a two-second advantage in getting certain kinds of data from the market um, about jobs and things like that. And to get to that point is just a fantastic achievement because, as you say, 15 years ago when we used Tellerate and when we did things um, in a different world, uh, this transparency wasn't there. And now we're talking about microseconds and even nanosecond delivery of data far too fast for you and I to do anything about it. But if we can write a program, maybe we can. Um, I think that the speed, the delivery of data is great. I go back to my concern. What's the nature of the slowly changing reference data? Who am I dealing with? What's my contract or my relationship with this counterparty? What obligations do I have? And what are the risks I take in getting the cash flows we've agreed to get? If I can understand that, and that's all data. That's, that's a schedule. That's indicative data about individuals and their credit history. If I can understand that, then I think we can avert the next, next risk or at least minimize it. I think the problem is people are going to decide not to, you know, not to follow those controls. These are controls. People don't like control. Justin, there's, well, there's been when, when, when crises happen, uh, lawmakers react. Right? Absolutely. And we saw that with Sarbanes-Oxley, and you can debate whether or not you know, it was an overreaction, but it, it's hard to debate that it didn't affect the IPO <laughs> markets, Absolutely. right? Mark Andreessen wrote an article recently you know, talking about that and you know, how it's really not attractive to be yeah. a public company a a anymore. Um, so Dodd-Frank, yeah. you know, yeah. good idea? Or I've got a, a friend in New York who makes markets for a big bank. He's been doing the same kind of work in, in, uh, in, in currencies and foreign exchange for a few decades. And 
his business, he, he's the first to admit, is moving offshore. Uh, Dodd-Frank is poorly conceived of. It's a lot of great ideas, but it's a, it's a bucket of, of bad ideas at the end of the day because they don't fit together. Right. No one knows how to implement them. Um, I think we're chasing capital away. Um, I see it in some really? of our clients who are, who are doing more work offshore in countries that used to be emerging and now they've emerged and, and they're growing like gangbusters and they're happy to take the business from the U.S. and from the major markets. The, do we have, what, what uh, shortcomings, if any, do we still have in this country in terms of disclosure regulations? Are financial institutions adequately disclosing, you think, what they need to disclose? You know, we were talking earlier with uh, some of our friends from, from the conference, and uh, some of whom have very senior roles at some of the largest banks in the world. And, and the thing that we agreed is that um, we've not heard the same question um, from different regulators or the same regulator more than once. In other words, every time we begin to disclose one thing that begets the next question. There's not a, uh, we don't see an end in sight in disclosure. Um, so it's just constantly, constantly drip, drip, dripping, uh, yeah. turning, turning I mean, the examiners the are screws. good people and they, they just want to understand more and the more we give them, the more they want to know. And I think that's fair, that's fine. Um, that's why I come back to the concept of reference data. If I, if I can understand and maintain my list of clients and products and the relationships between them, the contracts that I have, the obligations I have, then I can create any report that my counterparties or my regulators need to see. Um, I can show them my exposure to an instrument or to some dimension of an instrument or an asset class. And these are things I can't do if I have you know, sort of disorganized information about who I'm working with what each desk is doing and, and, and where I want to go with uh, each So project. bring that bring that back to Noetic. Uh, how is Noetic, uh, Noetic contributing to, to, to moving that, that uh, mission forward? Sure. I, I think our approach is we, uh, we like to partner with our clients. Uh, when we talk about Noetic partners, no Noetic means that we're rational and, and uh, we're not, uh, our, our approach is we want to do the best thing, not necessarily uh, the perfect thing. We want to make sure that data is fit for use. And then we want to partner with our clients, and we want to make sure our clients reach a level of maturity that they haven't reached before. So we, we begin with this, we have our, a model, we call it the Noetic Master Model, and it's based upon our experience at, at the biggest banks in the world, and it's a model that begins with the concept of parties. Who are the parties? And I think our clients who have uh, decided that the model works for them include some of the largest banks and brokers and exchanges in the world. Um, have decided to use the model in part or in whole to understand the events, the parties, and, and the products that get transacted. Our model is technology agnostic. It's, it will run on anything you like. If you're a Windows guy or a Unix or a Linux guy and you want to run Oracle or SQL Server. Um, but our products are designed to help our customers understand who their customers are, who their vendors are, who their counterparties are, who are their regulators, who are the owners, um, who are the uh, people who need to know about things, and then what are the relationships between those parties? So I think what we bring to the to the market and to our clients is a better understanding of who they are and where they are now, so they can make decisions about where they want to go. Financial services organizations are big IT shops in, <laughs> in a lot of ways, right? Absolutely. So a lot of your clients are building out you know, data factories. You know, they've Absolutely. got this data pipeline. I, mean, I think of of of, of uh, uh, fraud detection mm -hmm. and how that has changed gone from sampling, mm -hmm. right, and then maybe getting a call from your financial store letter yeah. six months down the road, maybe you got hacked, to yeah. now you're swiping a credit card and you need to get rejected in, in, in near real time. Absolutely. Is, is that type of, you know, analogy that, uh, or example, the, the, the sampling to the, sampling's dead in that mm -hmm. you know, example. Can that help us with regard to, you know, this overall data transparency and data quality problem? I think it's all part of the bigger picture. I, I think we need many types of people involved in the process. I think the, the, the thing that, that most excites me is that the tide has turned in the industry, in my view, from a concern about technology, which five years ago, who had the fastest, who had the bestest new thing, to the content. Mm. What is it that we're doing with this security, with this swap? with this counterparty or this group of counterparties. Who are we doing wi it with and why are we doing it with them? And it's allowing decision makers to make better decisions. So I think IT and, and this conference is all about 
the new role of the chief data officer or the data czar. Um, it's a role I've had uh, back when it was very contentious. IT didn't want us there because that was a space they felt they owned. Now it's a space I think that, that's legitimate and the COO and the CFO want someone focused on data quality and data architecture. So CEO is driving this. CEO, CFO, yeah. COO, these are the people who hire us now. Well the CFO certainly has, has always been involved from the standpoint of, you know, the, they always say the single version of the truth, yeah. you know, that's post Enron, et cetera. Um, but, but that CDO role takes us beyond the sort of financial domain, doesn't it? Absolutely. Into a lot of unstructured data and marketing. Absolutely. And I, I, you know, I, the CFO I, I see is, is interested in financial risk. As a CDO, yeah. I'm interested, my clients are in, interested in operational risk. Yeah, right. Like what's going to happen and, today? And, and business value. And transparency, <laughs> All right. absolutely. All right, good. Well, Justin, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Pleasure thanks meeting you time. and nice uh, to appreciate see it. All right, Paul Gillen and I will be right back. This is theCUBE. We're live from MIT Information Quality Symposium. We'll be right back.